afternoon, everyone. Um, I think we're ready to start. My name is Jody Black, and I'm the manager of institutional development here at Warrior Scholar Projects. And I am so honored to be leading this session today because I get to interview a colleague, a former colleague of mine, um, as part of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Aaron Johnson and I worked together at the USO headquarter office about 10 years ago. And despite all the time that has passed, since then her story as a breast cancer survivor has resonated and stayed with me all these years. And so I am so grateful that she has been willing to join us today to share her story. What I have taken away from her journey are messages of resilience, survivorship, and hope. And I'm so pleased again that she's been able to share what is a very personal journey with all of us today. Um, before we begin today's interview, I'd like to share a little bit about Erin's impressive background. Erin Johnson is a senior leader with over 20 years of experience in nonprofit impact development, brand advancement, and the United States Navy. She currently serves as the marketing strategy consultant for the U.S. Navy's submarine industrial base efforts. Previously, Erin served in multiple leadership positions across cancer research and veteran service non, uh, nonprofits, including serving as director of growth at Higher Heroes USA. Upon graduating from the University of San Diego with the Bachelor of Arts in International Relations, Erin was awarded a commission to the United States Navy. She served for 10 years as a surface warfare officer, completing several deployments in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. She also earned a Master of Business Administration from the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. Erin is a survivor of stage 3B invasive ductal carcinoma and has experienced firsthand the importance of adequate research and patient care. In 2016, she participated in a panel discussion with then Vice President Biden to discuss cancer survivorship among veterans and first responders as part of the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. She resides in Colorado Springs with her trusty pup, Teddy. Her husband, a Naval Intelligence Officer, is currently serving overseas. So with that, we're going to jump right in. And Erin, again, thank you so much for your willingness to be with us today. Um, to be let's here. begin with my first question. Why is it important for you to be with us today to share your story? Sure. So it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, I don't love the word awareness because I feel like everybody is aware of breast cancer. So I commonly refer to it as Breast Cancer, breast cancer Action Month. Um, so by taking the action of being here um, and learning more and, and just, you know, sharing, sharing with me, I, I'm really grateful for, for all of your support. Um, but I, I want to start by um, rattling off some important statistics. You know, I think that people are aware that breast cancer is, is common, but um, probably not so aware that it is becoming more common in young women and that uh, military members actually have a higher risk of developing breast cancer. So um, I'll get some numbers out of the way. Nationwide, 13%, which is about one in eight women, will develop invasive breast cancer in their lifetime. And 9% of those diagnoses will occur in women under the age of 45. I happened to be 29 years old when I was diagnosed. Uh, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer for women in the United States and the second leading cause of cancer deaths in the US, only second to lung cancer. 85% of all breast cancer diagnoses occur in women with no family history. Nearly 80% of young women under the age of 40, like me, find their breast cancer or their breast abnormality on their own because they are diagnosed before the age of 40, which is the uh, minimum screening age of mammography. Compared to older women, young women generally face more aggressive breast cancers and lower overall survival rates. And lastly, I'll, um, I'll mention a statistic that affects veterans and active duty uh, military women um, there's been studies that have shown that, that we, as a at active duty veteran female population um, of the armed services, have between a 20 and 40% higher risk of breast cancer compared to the general population. So 
you know, those statistics aren't meant to, <laughs> to scare anyone, but it's, it's real life. Um, we've made huge strides in, in breast cancer, in early detection and in saving lives. So it's true that the breast cancer mortality rate has dramatically decreased from the 1970s, but there are still 43,000, more than 43,000 women who pass away from breast cancer every year. Um, and that's why, that's why I share my story because um, if I can convince any woman or man um, on this call to do a self-exam and if they find abnormalities, advocate for themselves and, um, you know, hopefully save a life, then I've, I've done my job. Thank you. If you feel comfortable, could you please share your cancer diagnosis story and kind of set the stage for us as to where you were in your personal and professional life when you got the news? Absolutely. Um, so I mentioned I was 29 years old. Um, you know, there's never a good time in anyone's life to find out they have cancer at all. Um, my particular situation was, was uh pretty awkward. Um, my husband had just started one year unaccompanied orders to the Middle East. Um, we had just sold our condo in Hawaii and um, I had shipped my car and all of my belongings to the East Coast because I was about to transfer there to start department head school to become the chief engineer on a ship. Um, and I followed up on a lump that I had felt several months beforehand and saw my primary care manager about um, and was told that it was likely benign, nothing to worry about because I was 29 years old and had no history of breast cancer and was otherwise completely healthy. Um, so when I, when I did follow up, you know, a few months later, um, I, I advocated for myself and went back to the doctor and, you know, said, you know, I know you thought this was nothing, but it's still here and I'm getting ready to embark on a pretty lengthy, um, you know, military journey, which would require arduous deployments and just didn't want to have to worry about it. So I went in for further testing um, to include a biopsy. And I am forever grateful that my husband's boss in the Middle East had two, a mother and a mother-in-law who had both experienced breast cancer. And when my husband explained to him what was going on, uh, my husband's boss convinced him to get a get a plane ticket home, pay, the Navy paid for a plane ticket home. So he was actually with me when I received the diagnosis. Um, it was September 1st of 2009. I will never forget that September 1st is a Tuesday. Um, and, you know, my, my life changed forever. Um, it, it, it was a, a whirlwind few weeks after that. Um, you know, when I initially got the news, um, they weren't exactly sure um, what they were dealing with. The biopsy was um, concurrent in that it was in fact carcinoma, but not um, specific to what type of breast cancer it was. Um, and I had to make a bunch of really, really hard decisions that day. Um, the Navy medical team immediately requested a blood test and I had no idea why, um, they, they wanted to test for genetic mutations, <laughs> which I laughed at because again, I had zero known family history. Um, so, you know, on that day I had a, a blood draw, you know, I was diagnosed with cancer, had a blood draw for this genetic mutation was sent for further imaging to make sure that that specific tumor was isolated and it wasn't anywhere else in my body. Um, and set a date on September 11th for a lumpectomy for surgical, um, surgical treatment. And, um, at the time I made the decision to, to do what they call breast conserving surgery. So a lumpectomy to remove the tumor, um, which would have been followed by some amount of radiation. Um, so I had about two weeks to process all of that um, and, and get ready for, for that surgery. And um, 
two days before my surgery, my blood results came back and I found out I was BRCA1 positive. BRCA1 is a genetic mutation that causes between a 70 and 80 percent, carries between a 70 and 80 percent risk of developing breast cancer in, in the carrier's lifetime um, and also has a very high risk for ovarian cancer. Um, I was shocked at that news. Again, no family history. So that was a big surprise to me. Um, and, you know, the doctors were, I don't want to say encouraging, but um, definitely made sure that I knew that that significantly elevated my risk in developing an additional breast cancer or secondary cancer within five years. Um, knowing that and knowing that my husband was, you know, stationed overseas and that I had this whole military career ahead of me, um, I decided to go ahead with my lumpectomy and do my radiation and get on with my life and deal with that other stuff when I needed to. Um, oh, ignorance was so blissful then. <laughs> um, so that was the Wednesday before my surgery, Thursday night, as I was crawling into bed to get ready for a really, really early morning report date at the hospital the next morning. Um, the surgical resident called and said that there was unfortunate news that the MRI results had come back and my tumor was infiltrating several lymph nodes on imaging and also um, invading my chest wall. So at that time, a lumpectomy was no longer an option. Um, and I'll never forget his words. He said that they were canceling my surgery and would discuss my case at the tumor board tomorrow and get back to me. I mean, that was kind of the first realization I had that this was really serious. Um, up until that point, it seemed like, okay, I have this tumor. They're just going to take it out. I can get some radiation and I'll be about three months behind in my regular military schedule. Um, and so hearing that news was, was pretty devastating. Um, and the doctor did call Friday afternoon and the recommendation was to start chemo very quickly um, it, with the hope to shrink my tumor away from my chest wall so that they could safely operate on it. Well, the problem with that was, um, as you may recall from the earlier part of my story, I was, <laughs> I was actually staying with friends in their guest bedroom because I had moved out of my place and in total transition. I didn't have a car, I didn't have my stuff. Um, my husband didn't live in the, like, the same hemisphere as I did. <laughs> um, so it, it was a pretty challenging few weeks after that. They ended up having to do a secondary biopsy to really determine what grade of tumor and what type of tumor they were dealing with, which the initial biopsy didn't indicate. Um, and the reason they need to know that information is so that they can personalize the, the chemotherapy um, drug agents that, that a patient would receive. Um, and my, you know, I worked with my commanding officer, again, advocating um, you know, like I, I couldn't stay where I was in Hawaii. I had to get somewhere where I had a support network. Um, so I was lucky and then my commanding officer advocated to the detailer to get me up to Seattle to the Pacific Northwest where my whole family was. Um, you know, we were hoping that my husband would be able to get out of the Middle East, but we weren't sure. And we knew that I needed, I needed some significant support. So um, my mom, bless her, dropped everything <laughs> and came to Hawaii. And as soon as she got there, I guess actually, right. My husband went back to the Middle East with the hope of checking out um, and being able to move back to be close to me. Um, and in the meantime, my mom came and attended. I, I feel like I was at the doctor every day learning more terrible news. Um, so at the end of the day, before I moved to Seattle to start my treatment, my um, biopsy came back that I, I was BRCA1 positive and my tumor was what they call triple negative uh, breast cancer. And triple negative is called triple negative because there are three main tumors. This is getting really scientific and I'm sorry, but it's important. Um, three main receptors that most breast cancer tumors um, carry, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2, which is a human growth protein. So 80% of breast tumors have one or more of these receptor expressions. And the, I mean, every tumor is terrible. Um, these receptors have what they call adjuvant therapies that help prevent recurrence from those types of cancers. And the triple negative means it's negative for all three of those receptors. So this, um, 
is about 20% of all breast tumors and up, I mean, still even today, they, they don't know what causes it and the treatment options are very, very limited, um, basically chemotherapy, surgical removal and radiation. So um, they, that type of breast cancer tends to have a really, really high recurrence rate within the first five years of diagnosis and a much higher mortality rate within the first five years of survivorship than this other 80% of more common breast tumors. So that wasn't great news. Um, I got to Seattle at the end of September and really immediately started chemo. Um, I ended up doing 18 rounds of chemo, which was a ton. Um, but at the time, you know, I was young and I was healthy. And again, it was really my best defense against um, recurrent disease. So I was really lucky. Um, I had a great medical team at the military hospital, at Madigan Army Hospital in the Pacific Northwest, and then also had the opportunity to get a referral to one of the leading gynecologic oncologists in the country um, through a family friend of ours. And my, my military doctor um, was very supportive of me seeking a second opinion with this local um, expert up in Seattle. And as it turned out, I ended up doing all my chemo at the military hospital and then was referred up to um, the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Consortium for my surgery and all of my follow-on radiation. So I just received um, top-notch care and it lasted a really long time. You know, I, started, I was diagnosed September 1st, 2009 and finished my last day of radiation following a bilateral mastectomy and full node dissection and the 18 rounds of chemo um, on August 12th of the following year. So it was a it was a long road, um, but again, I had the support of my family. My husband was able, the, the Navy did humanitarian transfer him up to the Northwest. So he was able to be with me during my treatment. And, um, you know, the Navy gave me that year almost of, of paid limited duty. So I was able to just focus on my, my wellness and my recovery. Erin, you had, you were juggling so much at one time. I can't imagine um, how stressful and scary that situation might be. Um, you mentioned support that you received mm -hmm. from family and friends. And what do you think was the most helpful support you received during this journey? I think... Um definitely the support of my family. Um, if I had to pick one, <laughs> um, I would say three, but family first. Um, you know, like I said, my husband was there when I was diagnosed, um, but then had to fly back. My mom came and um, one of my cousins was a frequent flyer and worked with an airline at the Seattle Tacoma International Airport where I was going to land with my mom to start my treatment. And she convinced that airline to get passes through security for, she said it was just gonna be a few people. Well, there were like 30 people there, literally at the gate wearing pink t-shirts with balloons and roses um, to meet me as I walked off the plane, which was awesome. And, you know, every step of the way, um, my family checked in on me, uh, you know, it took a couple of weeks for my husband to arrive. So I was staying with my parents, um, you know, my, they were supportive and making sure I was at all my doctor's appointments. Um, I had a whole meal service during chemo where family members would drop off meals. My aunt just called and said, I'm going to come clean your house for you. And <laughs> I'm not going to take no for an answer. So just, you know, little things like that, that I didn't, that I would never ask for help with just happened. And it was so, um, really that support was so helpful in my journey. I, um, I kept a blog during the process of my, my treatment and my recovery and, you know, my family followed it and it was really helpful because I didn't have to constantly repeat what was going on. <laughs> they could just read and, you know, uh, those who prayed, prayed and um, those who cooked, cooked and um, those who wanted to just come hang out with me while I was chilling at home did. Um, and it was just such an awesome relief. And then I would say secondary to that, the military, you know, um, 
from my husband's boss in the Middle East who made sure that he was there on the day of my diagnosis. I mean, to this day, I, I've met him. He's an admiral, a retired admiral now. Um, and I, I gave him a huge hug and just said, thank you, because I did. it's because of him that I didn't have to tell my husband over the phone or Zoom or FaceTime that I had cancer, that he was there with me, which was a huge gift. Um, you know, in the military being so supportive of transferring him, doing a humanitarian transfer, he was in a very um, uh, important billet in the Middle East and, and they, um, they, they transferred him, you know, kind of no questions asked and the command that he transferred to his boss there was extremely supportive of him. Um, and, you know, just my, the military command that I transferred to and, you know, my, my new commanding officer, he gained this body who was pretty much worthless to him for at, at least a year. Um, and he was just, you know, emphatic that I was home and that I took care of myself. And he, he personally called me once a week to make sure that I was okay. And I didn't need anything. I had an awesome case manager who made sure that all of my civilian care was taken care of. And I didn't have to worry about billing issues. Um, it, I mean, just all around was incredible. And then after my treatment, when I was trying to figure out how to heal myself from all of the physical healing, you know, the emotional part was probably the hardest, honestly. Um, I joined a support group called the Young Survival Coalition, which is made for young women going through breast cancer, because as you might imagine, young women, you know, I was 29 and then 30 years old. I spent my 30th birthday celebrating my eighth round of chemo. Um, that we have different hurdles and obstacles than a, an older woman who is going through breast cancer. You know that you, there's so much of your life ahead of you when you're 30 versus when you're diagnosed at 70. Um, you know, you got you have to think about family. Um, you know, many young women are diagnosed shortly after giving birth. Um, in my case, I hadn't yet had children. Um, so it, it definitely um, impacts, I think, young women in different ways. So that, that support group and the friends that I made through that support group were really instrumental in my recovery because they provided support that, you know, as awesome as my family and my work were, um, they just didn't get it from a personal level. So I really um, benefited from the support of women who did. It's very powerful to hear. Um, if we can return back to um, your recovery process, mm -hmm. um, illness in general, we know can really affect a person's confidence and self-esteem. And I was wondering if you could talk about how you dealt with that issue and overcame related challenges so that you were able to eventually get back on your feet um, with comfort and confidence. Sure. Um, like I just said, I think um, the, you know, the physical part of breast cancer treatment was pretty brutal. Um, I would not recommend chemotherapy to my worst enemy. It's um, it's an unenjoyable process and mine happened to last a really long time. Um, and, you know, the, the nurses explained to me that I would lose my hair, which wasn't a surprise to me. What they didn't explain was um, full body alopecia, which means full body hair loss. So from like the neck down, that was really awesome, right? <laughs> um, the hair didn't bother me so much. I'm, I've never been a person who just, who feels some women or some men, some people are very defined by their hair and, and have a big attachment to it. And I just never, I feel like I've always fought my hair. Um, and in the military, I just wore my hair in a bun or a braid or whatever. Um, so I didn't really care so much about the baldness. Um, but when I, I lost my eyebrows and eyelashes, that was pretty startling to me. Um, I felt like I looked relatively cute in a, in my wig or a headscarf, but people without eyebrows and eyelashes tend to not look very well. And I didn't like to look not well. Um, so that was, that was a hard thing, you know, and then you think, oh, well, you can glue eyelashes on, but you can't, if you don't have any eyelashes to glue them to, it doesn't work. Trust me, I tried. Um, I was also, I kind of skipped over this part. Um, I received monthly injections of a drug called Lupron, which was an ovarian suppressant to help protect my ovaries in the event that I might want to have children after that whole process. So I was in 
um, chemically induced menopause to the entire process. So I was having hot flashes. So I would draw my eyebrows on every day and I would have to carry my eyebrow pencil in my purse with me because I would sweat the, <laughs> sweat the eyebrow pencil off and go back in to draw it back in. Um, so, you know, there were those little things. And then there was, of course, having a bilateral mastectomy. You know, I was 30 um, and lost both of my breasts. Um, I think, again, you know, when you're 30, your breasts are probably a lot more meaningful to you than when you're 70. Um, I'm just making that assumption because I'm not yet 70. <laughs> um, but, you know, they, it, as, you know, as a young woman, um, that was a big physical hurdle for me to get over. Um, and, you know, people joke about, oh, well, you know, me, you can get bigger implants, you know, you can get a bigger size and you won't have saggy breasts anymore. I'm like, well, you know, I was 30 and I never had kids. So my breasts weren't saggy at all anyway. And um, it's not in fact true once you have a mastectomy that you can get in fact bigger breasts. It doesn't work that way. Um, wouldn't it be nice if it did? Um, so, so that was really hard. Um, you know, waking up, I, I ended up having what's called a skin sparing mastectomy. So they kept my skin, they removed my nipple. Um, and I had what's considered immediate, immediate delayed reconstruction. So at the time of my mastectomy, they put in um, tissue expanders, which are temporary implants. And I went into surgery thinking those implants were going to be 30% inflated when I woke up. And I remember waking up from surgery and coming out of recovery and immediately looking down at my chest, thinking if that's 30% infl inflated, I'm in trouble. Um, it, it wasn't, they didn't end up inflating it at all because they had to remove much more tissue than they expected. So, um, so then I had to deal with, you know, recovering from surgery and going in several times a week after that to get inflated very quickly because I wanted to be fully inflated before I started radiation, um, because radiation is really hard on your skin. It actually burns your skin and causes a lot of scar tissue. So once you have radiated skin, implants are no longer um, really an option. So that's why they needed to make sure that I was at, at full, full capacity before, <laughs> before they zapped my skin and my, my skin wouldn't stretch anymore. So, um, so there's all that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm recovered from chemo. It took a long time. I was really tired and just worn out for a long, long time after healing from chemo. Um, my hair came back. You can't really see it, but I have a lot of hair. Um, it came back great. So that, you know, that was fine. I have implants now, I guess I don't have to wear a bra. So that's a benefit. Um, if you could call it that, um, I, I do have a couple of chronic issues. I have, um, I think I, I said earlier in my, my discussion that I did have lymph nodes with disease. So I had, I ended up having 28 lymph nodes removed from my right side. And that commonly causes a condition called lymphedema, which is swelling in my right upper extremity. So my right arm, because lymphatic fluid has no way of getting out of my right arm. So um, that's a chronic issue that I will deal with for the rest of my life. Um, you know, given everything else, that's a, <laughs> a small price to pay for, for, um, locally advanced breast cancer and, um, being alive and otherwise very healthy 13 years later. Wow. Thank you. Um, and we use the word journey because that really is what it is. I mean, I think you've fully illustrated that this is not a short-term um, lifestyle change, but at what point do you, did you begin to consider yourself to be a breast cancer survivor? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't honestly love the word survivor because it makes it sound like I did something you know, that, 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 that it was in my control. Um, I did everything that I could, um, and I made every medical treatment decision 
after doing research and advocating for myself um, to you basically I wanted to do whatever I could medically to prevent recurrence. Um, I never wanted to have a, you know, if I, if I did have a recurrence, I never wanted to second guess, you know, oh, if only I had done X, then I wouldn't be here. You know, I wouldn't be sick again. Um, but, you know, one statistic that I didn't mention is for young women, nearly 30% of young women diagnosed with breast cancer will have a secondary cancer in their lifetime. Um, and it's, it's, you know, I know women who were diagnosed and went through treatment and became vegan and stopped drinking and took up marathon running and still had a recurrence and became metastatic and passed away. I know women who changed nothing and are healthy, you know, survivors 25 years past diagnosis. Um, so, you know, do I feel incredibly fortunate to be alive and healthy? Absolutely. Um, I think the word survivorship is, is tough for women in the breast cancer community because there are unfortunately a lot of women, a lot of friends that I had that, that don't have that title. And it's not because of anything I did differently than them. Um, it just is the way life works. Um, I had a doctor, I actually asked my doctor, <laughs> my oncologist, right, when I was transferring from the Seattle area, um, as I was medically retired to DC, we were moving there under my husband's orders. Um, I asked her when I could consider myself cured, and her response was, you're cured when you die of something else. Um, I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's, that's heavy, right? Um, I you know, the type of breast cancer I had, triple negative breast cancer has a really, really high recurrence rate um, from one to five years past diagnosis. So when I got to that five-year mark, I he breathed a ginormous sigh of relief and threw a huge party at a winery in Washington <laughs> where I invited my whole family and all my friends to come celebrate, um, you know, celebrate that I was here and how grateful I was for their support in my journey. Um, I'm in Colorado now. I have a new medical team, a new oncologist. I met my new oncologist uh, this spring and he fanatically declared that, you know, at 12 and a half years post stage three, triple negative breast cancer, um, with no recurrence that I am considered cured. So, um, I'm going to take that and run with it. That's good news. Um, for those who have never had cancer or a long-term illness, what is one thing you wish they could understand about your experience? I think that, um, I wish I could, my friend actually posted about this yes, just yesterday on Facebook. Um, and I wish I could remember her exact words, but it reminded me of something that I've thought of in the past. And that's um, that cancer robbed me from my ignorance, um, robbed me of my ignorance. You know, it's when I went to the doctor so long ago and, you know, told her I felt this lump in my armpit and she responded back to me that it was, I was young and I was healthy and it was nothing. Um, never again will I believe that. Um, you know, for better or for worse, never will I believe that. Um, and not, it's not, that's not to say I'm a hypochondriac and I think that, that everything is something, but, um, I'm never, and have never been satisfied since then with it's nothing, especially if I think that there's something, um, and it's taken me, um, some significant self-advocacy, right. Um, and I think that that's a, it's, it's honestly a, a benefit about what I've been through is that it, it really taught me the importance of looking out for myself. Um, I think that something I wish other people would understand is that um, that self-advocacy is really, really, really important. Um, you know, I don't believe that 
had I not advocated for myself earlier that I never would have had cancer because clearly I already did. Um, but had I advocated for myself more strongly when I first felt that lump, maybe I would have been diagnosed at stage one and my treatment would have been a lot less severe than it ended up being. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that after I, you know, obviously when I was going through chemo and I looked sick, people could tell that I was sick and there was something wrong with me. Um, but after that, you know, my hair started growing back. I went back to work and kind of on my daily routine, but I was very much still healing. Um, I, I, I think even um, that was the most difficult part of my healing journey is the emotional healing. And I think that a lot of people thought, my husband included, I hope he's not listening. <laughs> Um, you know, my husband included that I was all better, that I wasn't going through treatment anymore, that, you know, 12 surgeries later, I was done with my surgeries and got the all clear from the doctors at year two, that I was ready to, to move on with my life. And that couldn't have been further from the truth. You know, it was, it was during that time that I really had to come to grips with this disease that, that changed my life, that changed my very being, that changed the fact that I was not going to be a biological mother. Um, and that was a, a lot to grapple with. So I guess my, my takeaway from that is, you know, if anybody listening knows somebody who has gone through a chronic illness or through a significant illness or an injury that they've, you know, visually healed from check in on them because the emotional healing process is, is just as tough, I think, if not tougher than the actual physical healing process. Yeah, that's, that's great for a lot of us to hear. Um, my next two questions I'm going to combine together because they're somewhat similar or related. Mm -hmm. um, and we can unpack them however is easiest. Um, so one, for anyone who's going through an illness like cancer and specifically breast cancer, what words of advice can you share? And then related to that, what are some of the biggest lessons you have gained through this life altering experience? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, the first, to the first one, I would say, well, I've said it over and over again, that's my magic word, right? Advocate for yourself. Um, no one knows you better than you. And if you feel like something's wrong, you need to speak up. Um, and for all of you military members and veterans listening who are seeking, you know, military medical facility or, or veteran um, VA care that you're, you're entitled to a second opinion. So if you hear something and you still feel like that's not right, or I know my body better than this doctor, you are entitled to a second opinion. So I strongly encourage you to seek that. Um, I think the second part is don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, people, people who love you when you're going through something terrible, they want to help you. And it's something that, that they can do. Um, you know, I learned, um, I think that the, the physical process of treatment, I don't want to say made me selfish. Selfish sounds negative, but I, I became pretty, um, self-absorbed because I, I had, I, I had to stay alive, right. <laughs> it was like, took all of my energy and focus just to, to be well and to concentrate on getting through treatment to, um, to be well. And I lost sight of how difficult it was for the people around me to watch somebody that they desperately love go through something so terrible. And, you know, one of the ways that they, my, my family and friends and support crew around me um, could take action. Whereas I was taking action every day by going to the doctor um, to physically heal. It helped them to be able to take action to help me. Um, so, you know, I would say that don't be afraid to ask for help. And when people offer it, accept it because um, because they genuinely want to help you, even if you don't feel like you need a meal or you don't feel like you need your house cleaned, like let them do it. Um, cause at the end of the day, you know, it's going to make them feel better. And 
um, it'll take some, some of the load off your plate. So I think that that would be some advice that I would offer. Um, why did you mash those questions together, Jody? Now I can't remember the second one. I'm sorry about that. The <laughs> other one was, what were some of the biggest lessons that you learned? Right, away from okay, business biggest career? lessons. Yeah, so many lessons. Um, besides advocating for yourself, a huge lesson that I learned was um, courtesy of my favorite chemo nurse, Judy. And she said something that really, really resonated with me that has kind of become my mantra. You know, a lot of people said to me during my treatment that, you know, oh, you know, God has a plan for you or good things, you know, or, you know, things happen for a reason. And believe what you will, like those statements just really pissed me off because <laughs> like here I was 29, like had my whole life planned out, like my whole life ahead of me, everything was great. And then this thing happened. And I, I mean, it was just terrible. Like what, what reason was there for me at 29 years old to get this catastrophic disease that abruptly halted my life plan? Um, so I was complaining to her. This is why she said this to me because, you know, I'm getting my chemo infusion and I was complaining to her. And she said that she prefers to flip that and say, you know, turn that into a statement. And it's um, the statement is good things come from bad things. And I, I, I mean, I just like could not have agreed with that more. And it is applicable in so many different aspects and walks of life and challenges. You know, everybody has their cancer, right? Everybody has seemingly insurmountable obstacles in their life to deal with. And sometimes it's, it, you know, it feels defeating and why is this happening to me? And what is the reasoning for this? And sometimes there just is no reason, but to believe that good things can come out of that bad thing is really empowering. Um, you know, I planned on being a mother. I planned on making the military my career and neither of those things happened. Um, but my life is amazing. Um, my life is fully fulfilled. Um, I have an awesome dog, and, you know, maybe one day when my husband's out of the military, we'll adopt, but until then I've made the most of the, the time I have. And, um, you know, my, I was medically retired, so I wasn't able to make the military my career. However, I've spent, you know, since 2012 when I was medically retired. So for the past decade, um, in positions continuing to serve, you know, working for the USO and then another veteran service organization, a cancer research nonprofit, and even in this corporate role I'm in, in this consulting capacity, helping the Navy um, expand their, their submarine building force. Um, so is it what I planned? No, but I love where I am. So it's, um, you know, I would just encourage people when they're up against a, a, a seemingly insurmountable obstacle that um, just to remember that that there, there can be good that comes from it. Thank you. It looks like we have some Q and A's, Erin, if it's okay, okay. if I can read sure. them for you. Um, we have one question from Cassie Elder. She says, you have highlighted the importance of self-advocacy. What advice would you give to someone trying to advocate for themselves or seeking a second or third opinion, but keeps getting shut down, especially when navigating the VA? Oh, that's tough. Um, I think I think the VA has come a long way in their care of women, um, but I think that there is still a really long way to go. Um, you know, I haven't had to seek medical care from the VA because I went from being active duty to an active duty spouse. So I can't really speak to navigating the VA system, but I do know um, in working with, when I was active duty, working with a case manager to manage my civilian medical care, that the VA does have case managers. Um, so if you are not getting the care that you feel like you are entitled to, or that you need, I would highly recommend you seeking out a case manager to help you navigate through that process. 
and they're not going to seek you. They're not, <laughs> they, they've got a busy caseload, so they're not going to hunt you down. You really, that's where the advocacy and the self-advocacy comes in. If you're not getting the care that you feel like you need, um, you need to find a, a case manager and they have them, um, you know, contact your local VA and, and research that because they're there and they are fully ready and, and willing to help. Thank you. I feel like self-advocacy is really a great le universal lesson, whether it's about our health or about any situation or obstacle we're facing. That's just a great reminder. Um, no one's going to help us unless we help ourselves first. Exactly. And I think that I, I'm, I'm going to speak broadly. I think we as women tend to be really not great at that. Um, you know, that, that we, we don't do a great job looking after ourselves. We're, we're busy serving everybody else and we don't want to be seen as a nuisance. Um, and I would say that having cancer at 29 years old, uh, my sister would say, I don't know, she's, she's not listening because she's a fifth grade teacher. So she's, she's busy forming, forming and shaping the lives of our youth. But um, she says that cancer made me feistier. And I look at that as a really good thing, you know, that I feel like um, I'm fully comfortable saying no when I don't want to do something, when it doesn't align with my priorities or my values. Um, and I'm also fully comfortable not taking no for an answer <laughs> um, and, and really looking for, for that yes. You know, and if I'm not going to get that yes from the person I'm talking to, there's always somebody else to talk to. So I would just encourage, um, encourage you to find that, that other person who's there to listen to you and, and help. We have another question now. This one is from Gina. Um, she says, I'm interested in the muscles you needed to build and to heal emotionally. This could apply to so many things that we'd all find your lessons helpful. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, our tear ducts a muscle because I cried a lot. <laughs> um, I, I would say that I cried way more in my emotional healing than I ever cried in my diagnosis and physical um, recovery phase of my cancer journey. Um, I sought therapy, um, because, you know, I, I had have a really supportive family, a wonderfully supportive husband who I left out of the story deployed literally two weeks after I finished my last round of radiation and was gone for eight months. So, um, you know, I kind of was trying to play a, a dual role of, appearing to be the spouse at home, keeping my collective crap together <laughs> and actually being the spouse at home, losing my collective crap on a daily basis. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, my family was great, but I, I kind of hinted before that a, I didn't want to burden them with my emotional load. Um, cause I felt like I had put them through enough, but B I didn't really feel like they would understand. Um, so, you know, I sought the support group, um, the support of, of Young Survival Coalition, which was huge for me. Um, but then also professional therapy for, a, you know, a, a nice, I went through um, military medicine and was able to get a civilian therapist who specialized in, in um, patients going through cancer. Um, and I'd never been to therapy before. You know, I, I'd always considered myself strong and level-headed and, you know, emotionally, um, I, emotionally with it. I, I, I never thought of myself as needing therapy and it ended up being, I mean, short of, you know, all of the physical treatment that helped physically heal me, um, the best thing that I ever could have done for myself and really being able to kind of sort through the trauma um, and, and my therapist used that word trauma. I'd never considered it before. Um, I remember, uh, shortly into my treatment, the Navy safe Harbor, which was their kind of wounded warrior program at the time. Um, they had a safe Harbor agent call me a representative call me and, you know, I'm like bald 
freezing my buns off at home, sick, sick as a dog after, I don't know, my fourth or fifth round of treatment. And, and this agent calls me and says that she's part of Navy Safe Harbor for wounded, ill and injured sailors. And I said, well, why are you calling me? <laughs> and she said, like, aren't you going through active cancer treatment right now? And I said, oh yeah, 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 I am. Um, but my therapist really helped me recognize that I had been through a trauma. You know, it wasn't necessarily a, a physical trauma in a, a wartime injury, um, but it was a, a trauma to my life um, and to my body nonetheless. And um, putting a name to that and then, you know, moving forward through that healing process was really pivotal in my emotional healing journey. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few comments that I don't think you can see. So I'd like, I'd love to read them off to you. Okay. Um, some of our participants. Melissa says, I love you so very much, Erin. I'm so glad we were able to make their airport event happen. Oh yeah. That's my cousin, the um, airport event strategist. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sheila says, I liked Erin's statement about those who pray, prayed, those who cook, cooked, and about the support that she received. Mm -hmm. um, those are all really great um, comments. I agree with Sheila. Um, I enjoyed hearing those as well. Um, I don't know if we have any other comments or questions. Um, we still have a little time. But um, if not, Erin, um, thank you so much for your time, your willingness to share a very personal story um, with this audience. Um, I really do feel that people will take a lot away from this. I can just tell by the comments that people have left that your story has made an impact. And so we're just grateful that you were willing to share this with us. Um, well, I'm grateful. Gina says to be she's great invited. for your courage and humor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, again, I have from the very beginning been very open with my story. Um, and some women aren't, and that's completely their prerogative. And, and um, I just felt like if, if I could share that I, I should, um, and it, you know, I, I, at, again, at 29, you know, when I tell people I'm a breast cancer survivor, the co most common reactions are, you know, oh, you, you know, oh, you were so young and um, oh, does it run in your family? And oh, um, you know, they must have caught it early, which, you know, yes, I was young, but the other two are totally not true. Um, breast cancer did not run in my family at all. Um, and I didn't catch it early because I was 29 and that's 11 years before women usually get their first mammogram. So, um, you know, it's, if I can dispel some of those myths and also encourage everyone on this call to do yourself exams and you know, like, it's kind of like at the airport, if you see something, say something, <laughs> if you feel something, say something, go to the doctor. And if, you know, if you don't feel like they're taking you seriously, then go get a second opinion. You're it's your right. You are entitled to it. So advocate, advocate for yourself. 100%. Before I hand it over to my colleague, Alina, I just have one more comment I wanted to share with you. Cassie Sanchez says, thank you for sharing your story, Erin. There's so much power in it and you're in your telling of it. And I agree. It's my privilege. And so I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Alina, as we close up this session. Um, she does have some administrative announcements she'd like to share. And once again, Erin, thank you so much. I would just like to add on to that. Thank you as well, Erin. Um, I mean, your story was incredibly impactful. And thank you for everyone who's been tuning in, whether you're tuning in via Zoom or um, live on Facebook. We appreciate that you were able to make the time to listen to Erin's story with us today. Um, 
for those of you who would like to support the Warrior Scholar Project, next month on November 9th, we do have a trivia night event, which is set to be very fun. And we do have a celebrity hosting this. So if you'd like to participate in the trivia night, you can go ahead and head over to our website where you can find a registration link to sign up. And if you are an alumni, we have a very exclusive trivia night for you hosted by myself. And that's taking place on the Marine Corps birthday, November 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern Central. And of course, if any of you ever have any questions about the Warrior Scholar Project, what it is we do, and our boot camps that we host, you can always head to our website or reach out to anyone on our outreach team. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Thank Take you care. so much. Bye.